Module 3, Building DPOs, Equity, Ensuring Equity with Disabled People's Movement, Impairment, Sex, Ethnicity, Age, Class, Rural slash Urban, etc. Hello, I am Carrie Ann Eiffel, a Vice Chair of the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum. And I come from the island of Barbados in the Caribbean, and I'm also the president of the Barbados Council for the Disabled. We are a cross impairment organization representing the views of our members to government. We are a national umbrella organization, meaning that in our membership are organizations led and controlled by disabled people with different focus and interests, such as local organizations, disabled women, youth network, and organizations that focus on different impairments, specific impairments, such as blind, deaf, neurodiverse, or learning difficulties. We have found by choosing to and listening to each other we have much more chance of influencing national government to improve things for disabled people across Barbados and across the Caribbean region. I would like to welcome you to this third module of our online course aimed at developing disabled youth leaders around the Commonwealth. Our theme today and this month is building this DPO, ensuring equity within the disabled people's movement, impairment, sex, ethnicity, age, class, rural and urban, etc. A word on the language we use in the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum, CDPS. Disabled people, why we still choose to call ourselves disabled people? In the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum, CDPS, we call ourselves disabled people because of the development of the social model of disability. In the 19th and 20th century, a disabled person's medical condition was thought to be the root cause of their exclusion from society, an approach now referred to as the medical or individual model of disability. We use the social model of disability, where the barriers of environment, attitude, and organization are what disable people with impairments and lead to prejudice, and discrimination. So to call ourselves persons with disabilities is to accept that we are objects and powerless. We also view ourselves as united by a common oppression. So are proud to identify as disabled people rather than people with disabilities. When we are talking about the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, when we're talking about the United Nations on the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, We will use people or persons with disability. Recap. In the last two months, we focused in September on the paradigm shift. As you now know, this means the transition away from a negative, culturally based ideas and attitudes based on trying to explain impairment 
as punishment, the impact of evil spirits or gods, and is expressed by prejudicial stigma and attitudes. B, charity ideas based on pity and providing refuge and asylum to those with impairment, etc. Or ostracized by society. C, medical model ideas that focus mainly on our impairment and healing us. The problem is often medical science has no answers and this approach puts the focus on how we are different from normal. Of course, we need medical support, but we do not want to be seen through that lens, which often leads to our isolation and segregation. Impairment, long-term or permanent loss of physical, sensory, psychosocial, or mental function is part of the human condition. The issue is how it is responded to. We promote the social model of thinking that empowers us as disabled people to challenge the barriers in society, in the environment, organization, communication, and attitude, and find solutions that lead to our equal treatment. This social model thinking has been the powerhouse of our transforming our life. We have to do it together, collectively. This was the theme of October. We look at the dynamics of building campaigns together from in the local village, our town, right up to national getting disability rights based legislation and imp implementing it. These campaigns have led us to the understanding we are the experts on what is needed to include us, which is why we say nothing about us without us. Based on this understanding, disabled people and our organization campaign and won at a global level at the United Nations, UN, the need for human rights to be explicitly extended to all disabled people. This was finally achieved in the United Nations Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the UNCRPD, in 2006. From isolation to solidarity. A summary of what we are examining today could be from isolation to solidarity. What is essential for all of us with different impairments, life, experiences and background to come together to be the most effective as DPOs in achieving our aim to bring about implementation of the UNCRPD and developing disability equality. Disabilism is the oppression that still dominates the world where disabled People, people with a wide variety of impairments are disabled by the cultural norms and attitude, organization of society, and the resultant environment all make us 
be less than we could be. We call this oppression disableism. Though it is worldwide, it manifests in different forms. We as people with impairment, whether we are born with them or acquire them, whether they are physical or mental, whether they are visible or invisible, we experience these individually. From the moment a child is born, he or she emerges into a world where he or she receives messages that to be disabled is to be less than a world where disability may be tolerated, but in the final instance is inherently negative. We are all regardless of our status, shapes, formed by the pol politi politics of disabilism. Our socialization in these circumstances leads to our internalizing these negative views. Internalized oppression is not the cause of our mistreatment. It is the result of our mistreatment. It would not exist without the real external oppression that forms the social climate in which we exist. Once oppression has been internalized, little force is needed to keep us submissive. We harbor inside ourselves the pain and the memory, the fears and the confusion, the negative self-images and the low expectations turning them into weapons with which to re-injure ourselves every day of our lives. Our first job in building our movement has to be to help each other overcome the impairment of our disabling world on how we view ourselves. Controversial debates and psycho psychological perspectives Taylor and Francis. Thank you. Okay, wait, hang on. I think you, that that you was a footnote. Somewhere. You should yeah, be saying a, our confidence and self image. Yeah, I found it. That's that's it was a um yeah. that's the way Jaws works. It read the foot it showed me the footnote. Okay, I'm ready again. Our confidence and self-image is often disempowered. Overcoming isolation, we have to empower each other. Let me tell you the ways we have done this in Barbados through our Barbados Council for the Disabled. First, the Barbados Council for the Disabled is an organization, as I said before, which is made up of member organizations, member DPOs. We have over 20 organizations under our umbrella, which cover the spectrum of disabilities. From among these members, we elect a board of directors, which advises and governs the policy of the BCD. These members cover, again, the ambit, the cross-section of disabilities, as well as being reinforced by ex officio representatives of government institutions. Next, we have a network of subcommittees made up from among our board of directors and our very qualified secretariat staff. These staff members, some of whom themselves have disabilities, some do not, but we all work together to 
build policy and to expand our projects and programs to change the lives of persons with disabilities. We carry out surveys, conduct public engagement activities. We work to develop services for ourselves to empower ourselves. When the government passed legislation in 2017, making it illegal to park in disabled parking spots, we, the Barbados Council for the Disabled, became the body who issued the parking permit to persons with disabilities on behalf of the government. We hold regular meetings where we invite our members to sit in and to share with us how they are developing. Not just, it's not just a top down or a bottom up approach. It is a cross sectional approach. When we understand what happens in each organization, other organizations can shore up and support and assist each other. When we understand what is happening in the community of the deaf, then the community formed by the organizations of the blind can attend and support their activities when our organization for the multiple sclerosis hold their activities, members from the Myasthenia Gravis Association can attend and support their activities. And when we have to champion government, when we have to solicit and work with them, we come together and each organization, each individual disability category is represented from among them so that we give a cross section. There's not one person speaking on behalf of, but a collection of voices speaking together. All of this is important and we do it through training so that we all can understand and appreciate what we do and how we do it. So let me tell you a little bit about me. As you may have noticed, my impairment is blindness. So let me tell you the things I need if you like good manners or disability etiquette to include blind and visually impaired people in your organization. First and foremost, Ensure that if you are inviting me to your activities, that you provide accessible information, whether it is electronic, braille, or large print. Whether I ask for a reader or a support aid, these are the things that I need to participate in your meetings, having come informed. Make sure you share that information with me ahead of time so that I can read it up in my preferred format. Secondly, greet me at the door. Explain to me where I'm going, where I'm sitting, who's sitting beside me, what the room is like. Ask me if there's anything else I need so that I can feel comfortable and confident in the room. If I don't know where I am, if I don't know who's around me, then I'm vulnerable. Next, if you're having an activity where you have ushers, persons who are escorting me around the room, make sure that they are trained, make sure that they understand how to facilitate the needs. Make sure you get your lighting correct. Persons with low vision don't see the same in every lighting situation. So make sure that you have proper lighting, clear pathways, encourage your participants Encourage persons not to leave things hanging out on the floor or sticking out in the middle of the road or any of those things, which may be an obstruction to my mobility. As I use my cane, I want to be able to navigate. Yes, it helps me to avoid obstacles, but you can also help me by making sure that those obstacles that are movable, that are unnecessary to be in that spot, are not there. Most importantly, ask what I need. Don't assume. Don't grab hold of my arm or my cane or any walking aid. If I happen to be using a service animal, do not approach the animal. Do not speak to the person that may be accompanying me. Speak directly to me. 
involve me in your activity. Do not hold programs and activities and make me feel like I'm an afterthought. Don't say, oh dear, I forgot to get it in Braille. We'll send it to you afterwards. Don't create activities that I cannot participate in equally like the other attendees. And most of always, always remember, persons who are blind and visually impaired have a voice, often a strident one. Let us share among the meeting. Now over to Richard, our reser, our general secretary, to unpack the other essential ingredients to building successful cross impairment, disabled people, organizations, with the help of a range of contributions from a range of disabled people across the Commonwealth. Thank you, Kerry ann for that uh, really informative uh, view of both your DPO in Barbados and your tips on getting it right for blind and visually impaired people. Uh, we need to make coming together of disabled people a positive experience. So the experienced campaigners and others new to trying to act collectively need to work together to change and improve our position as disabled people in society. The key word here is respect. This means treating each other and ourselves with respect. Remember that internalized oppression Kerry ann mentioned. Many of us have grown up with, with, with it, often reduces how welcome we are of difference. Many disabled young people end up not wanting to have anything to do with other disabled people, or if they have hidden impairments trying to pass. Disabled society, Overcome your impairments, they say. Make us also not ask for what we need. And we also have fear of being uh, helped, fear of being other than normal. This idea of being normal is really strong. Even when it's obvious that we are different, we still think, for instance, like I used to as a post-polio survivor, that it is easier to walk around even with a lopsided gait and fall sometimes and stand for long times without a chair than have a chair. I remember I was in my 30s before my partner said, why are you in such a state? And I said, well, I'm standing here. And she said, well, why aren't you sitting down? I said, well, it, it doesn't look very manly. And she said, don't be ridiculous. You need a chair and that's what you need. And she then went on to convince me that I needed a wheelchair and I'd been brought up to overcome my impairment. That's what the physios and the rehabilitation experts told you. And of course, they're completely wrong because a wheelchair is an aid, just as a cane or a stick or crutches are. And so we need to be happy about using our aids and appliances. So asking for your access needs is an important act of personal liberation. If you aren't even asking for your own access needs, you're hardly going to change the world for other disabled people. It means ensuring equality by analysing what the impairment-based access accommodations and support participants need to function. In any group of disabled people, it means becoming familiar with each other's access needs and if possible, learning how to accommodate and where possible, meet them. My friend Micheline Mason, who you heard from in a previous program, was one of the pioneers of setting up the disability movement in the UK 50 years ago. And they started something called the In From The Cold Collective, because being outsiders in society meant that they needed to come together. And the biggest problem they had coming together with people who used specially adapted vehicles to get across the country that the government gave you could only fit one person. Uh, blind people, deaf people, people with mental health issues, people who neurodiverse, uh, coming together, they had to really learn about each other's needs and how to actually meet those needs. 
And that was really the beginning of the movement. So if we don't accommodate each other, we can't really expect society to accommodate us. And that can be expensive, but often we can use our collective skills to meet each other's needs. And in that, in From the Cold Collective, a number of people who were not deaf learned sign language so they could communicate with those who were. And that, of course, meant that the deaf people felt welcome. Similarly, the sorts of things Carrie ann was talking about, they learned good disability etiquette for each other. We will talk more about etiquette later and it will be laid out in the course notes. This doesn't just meeting, me, mean treating each other equally because e what is equality if you're unequal to start with? It means ensuring equality by an an analyzing what the impairment-based access, cultural, religious, language, social, and economic differences might be that are internalized by people and come out in their discourse. One way that we handle this is by together creating ground rules or more formally standing orders that ensure these differences are addressed and people can't just ride roughshod over other people. So for instance, one person speaking at a time, not speaking again till everyone else who wants to speak has spoken, taking a balance of speakers with different impairments or balance of men and women to speak. These would be some of the ground rules that we would make keeping things confidential so people feel that they can actually talk about their experiences and not have them spread around. So some of the barriers we face are societal. The language we converse in. In the CDPF, we use English as it's the official language of the Commonwealth. But we must recognize that the first language of participants and the, um, the ways they find to include them so the more we get down to the grassroots, the more we need to use the language of the people, whether it be Hindi, Swahili, Urdu, uh, and a whole range of other languages that operate across the Commonwealth. And we need translation that isn't just off the web, but uses the expression and idiom of the local culture. So we need local people who are bilingual to actually do that work. We need to recognize caste and class. Examples, in many parts of South Asia, caste is seen as a predetermining of people's social status. We must work against this to create a fora where all can communicate their views on an equal level. And of course, sexism is really dominant in most cultures in the world. It's deeply embedded where boys and men have been used to seeing themselves as superior to girls and women and objectifying them to satisfy their sexual desires. Creating a space for disabled women and girls to meet together without men and boys is a necessary way for them to work out what their demands are and give a non-oppressive solidarity to each other. But of course, Girls and women need to be able to function within the wider disability movement. And so men and boys in the umbrella DPOs or local organisations need to challenge their own sexism. The males need to take responsibility for their sexist behaviour, over speaking women or most certainly not treating them disrespectfully or in a sexualized and abusive manner. Going to take a clip from Patience. Uh, who's in Nigeria and runs a women's disability organization now. Hello, everyone. This is Patience Ubulu Dixon from Nigeria. Um, I just want to bring a thought or a few thoughts to us today around girls with disability and the challenges that they face. Um, girls, uh, adolescents with disabilities. They face lots of challenges in education, in healthcare, services and treatment, in transportation, even in social protection. Why? Because they face, they have uh, barriers uh, because they are girls and because they have girl, they are girls with disability. Uh, associated with stigma, myths, stereotypes, uh, and this is uh, something that has actually made them invisible from the space. 
Um, us as an organization in Nigeria for women with disability, we are doing what, what we know we can to do the right thing, to also bring the issues around girls uh, with disability to the space and to ensure that we amplify their voice and also bring them um, out, um, make their issues visible within the, the space. Uh, so this is some of the things I just wanted to share with us today around um, girls with disability. Thank you. So that's our first clip from Patience. How the society is stratified by caste, tribe, or cultural group, or social class will vary. But some things are fairly constant. Racism, which is power and prejudice based against those with skin color and other bodily features and ethnic differences, has a long history of exploitation, dehumanization, and subjugation, including uh, the British slave trade started by uh, the Stuart kings and ran for 400 years. And at a similar time, the Spanish did the same things into Latin America and the Caribbean, and indeed the French. Racism in post-colonial countries with a significant settler population of European uh, extraction, uh, devalues and subjugates the first peoples and is a major issue that needs addressing centrally, especially because levels of impairment are higher due to their treatment. Both, this is true in Canadian uh, First Nations, New Zealand Maori and Australian Aborigines and Tory Strait Islanders, uh, where all of them have higher levels of impairment than the rest of the population, which is due to their social situation, as well as psychological impact of being on the receiving end of racism, often leading to alcoholism and other such things. First Nations in these countries need their own organizations and umbrella DPOs need to make accommodations and welcome their participation. Umbrella DPOs members need to challenge their own thinking that they may have imbibed from the dominant views in society. We're going to see a clip now from people First Peoples Australia Network, uh, which is an Australian DPO, an associate of ours, uh, and I think makes a lot of these points. The Disability Royal Commission is an opportunity for people with disability and elders who might have experienced abuse, neglect, violence or exploitation during their life to tell their story and be respectfully listened to. The Royal Commission is made up of seven people who are elders and respected members of their own communities. It has representatives from different community groups, including Australia's First People, People Living with Disability, and the LGBTIQ plus community. These people have come together to start what we might call a message stick, so they can begin to collect all these stories. Over the next three years, they will take the message stick and start gathering stories from people with disability and elders who feel that they have not been treated right by service providers and workers, or maybe even community or family members. If you feel you would like to tell your story, you could either come along to a formal hearing, or if you feel more comfortable, to a casual yarning circle. If you feel a bit worried or scared to tell your story, it can be arranged for you to tell your story with only one or two people in a safe place and your name will be kept secret or you can even tell it over the phone. If you think you might need some legal help before telling your story, this can also be arranged for you. The Royal Commission will try to hear all these stories by travelling across the land, visiting as many regions and communities as possible over the three years. At the end of the three years, they will take these stories that have been entrusted to them and present them to a group of government representatives. 
These representatives will use the information from all these stories to make changes to make sure people with disabilities and elders are cared for, supported and respected in the future. After all this, the Royal Commission Elders will then go back to their communities. However, the First Peoples Disability Network will continue yarning with many of them around disability business. If you would like information on how you or someone you know can tell your story, you can contact Your Story Disability Legal Support on 1800 771 800 or call the Royal Commission on 1800 517 199 or go to the First People's Disability website at fpdn.org.au. Where tribal racial differences exist, effort needs to be made to include tribal and ethnic minorities in DPOs or in post-racist societies such as South Africa. Effort needs to be made to make DPOs reflective of the majority population i.e. the black population rather than dominated by the white population. So there's much to be done to challenge these divisions in our society and other countries such as tribal groups in India and so on need to be thought about in Kenya, many places across the Commonwealth. Let us turn now to including youth. First, with a clip from Kiemba Wilbert, who is the CDPF youth representative from Uganda, where he runs his own DPO. Kiembo is nonverbal and relies on using information technology, which he has a diploma in, to communicate uh, with the support of a worker voicing for him. Greetings to all participants of the CDFP Youth Leadership Training Course. Allow me to convey the voices of our disabled youth in the heart of Uganda. I am Kihembo Wilbert, the youth representative for the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum. And I proudly serve as the executive director of the Voice of the Youth Representative. Organization is unique, being led by disabled youth and our mission is unwavering to advocate for the rights and opportunities of our fellow youth who face distinct challenges due to disability. Our journey is guided by an unshakable belief, one that transcends the boundaries of abilities and disabilities alike. We firmly hold that every individual, regardless of their physical or cognitive differences deserves the opportunity to live their dream life. Let us be reminded of the timeless quote that says the future of the world belongs to the youth. In Uganda, my homeland, over 78% of the population is under 30 years of age, representing a significant portion of the nation's potential and promise. Sadly, a very small rate of disabled youth are at the forefront hindered by cultural beliefs and negative attitudes towards them, limiting a quality of opportunities for disabled youth. However, Uganda is not alone in grappling with these challenges. The exclusion of a disabled youth from leadership and society is a global issue. Yet, with the concerted efforts and unwavering commitment, we can change the narrative. It is essential that we collectively impress the belief that disability should never be a barrier to fulfilling one's dreams. As we move forward in our shared journey towards empowerment and inclusivity, let us remember that the strength of our nation and indeed the world lies in its diversity. This diversity encompasses the rich potential and capabilities of disabled youth. To illustrate this point, let me introduce to you my two VYD colleagues, Masereka Robson and Tumwesije Brian. Masereka Robson, beacon of an untapped potential among disabled youth, is a student of journalism and a dedicated businessman dealing in crafting shoes. However, he has encountered barriers when trying to access government programs to boost his business. His history reflects the resilience and aspirations that lie within disabled youth. To Mwesi J. Bryan, 
another extraordinary young individual is visually impaired and he holds a bachelor's degree in counseling psychology from Kyampogo University. Brian aspires to contribute actively and emerges a response efforts in his community. His remarkable dedication and determination prove that disability should never hinder one's contribution to society. Some of the government programs come uh, wanting people with disabilities and I fail to get it because they do tell me that uh, my national ID is not in progress. I've tried many times to visit near offices in order to access my national ID, where I have failed to get it. Uh, this, I take it as a barrier in getting government programs like media, uh, supply of the materials such as branches, and the opening of circles, savings and crediting circles. So that is one of the big barrier I face in accessing government programs. This one can be done through involving the youth with disabilities on the committee they are to plan in case disasters arises in the community whereby the youth will be getting aware about how to deal with disasters and able to maneuver or to deal with the situation in case it occurs. For example, in case the disaster has occurred where there is uh, Maybe I can talk about uh, a, a, youth has, a youth with a disability has going to perform somewhere in music and he falls down. We should be able to know how to handle them and we give them uh, skills how to deal with such people. Also, uh, talking about how to deal with floods. We should be able to provide gadgets that can help the, the, the youth to deal with floods. For example, wheelchairs that can help them to, 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 to evacuate them from the place where the disaster has happened. Our mission is clear. It's our collective responsibility to break down the barriers that restrict disabled youth from achieving their dreams. This mission transcends borders and is not solely for Uganda, but for the world at large. It is a mission for equality, justice, and a brighter future for all. To achieve this, we must foster a society that is inclusive and accessible, where disabled youth have equal access to education, employment, and leadership opportunities. We must challenge and change the negative attitudes and stereotypes that persist, replacing them with honor, understanding that recognizes the potential and capabilities of our disabled youth. Together, we can create a world where disability is not an obstacle, but a unique perspective that enriches our communities and societies. The future of the world truly belongs to the youth and this future must include disabled youth. Let us commit this mission hand in hand and work tirelessly to empower disabled youth in Uganda and around the Commonwealth. In their success, we will find the strength and inspiration to create a more inclusive and equal world for all. Thank you, and let us stand united in this noble endeavor. Together, we can make the dreams of our disabled youth a reality, not only in Uganda, but throughout the Commonwealth and beyond. As we have said before, the Commonwealth Disabled People's Movement 
is dominated by older people like myself. We need their experience and wisdom, but also need to create a space for disabled youth in fora, forums and empowerment groups, networks to provide. We also need to provide training such as on the course and more intense training the trainer courses where disabled youth learn to train on the paradigm shift and develop such courses with their own input of experience and understanding. To help us understand the dynamics of this, I'll turn to Dr. Miro Griffiths, who is a disabled activist, but also a postdoctoral researcher at Leeds University. And he's also a policy creator, and he's currently working on disability youth across Europe as a project. So let's have a look what Miro has to say. And you'll need to listen carefully to this because he's more academic than some of the other uh, explanations. So my name is Miro Griffiths. Uh, I'm a disabled person. First and foremost, I consider myself to be a disabled activist. I'm also a disability studies scholar at the University of Leeds, and I hold various policy uh, positions within the context of, of disability. When I'm thinking about the role of disabled people's organizations, I'm thinking about the significance placed on trying to resist current arrangements that sustain and produce disablement, and to think about the articulation of an alternative vision for how society should be organized. So for me, DPOs are straggling, um, str straddling two separate entities. One is the resistance, and one is the imagination for an alternative. And young disabled people's participation is essential to both of those spaces. What I think is really important is when thinking about the contributions of young tail people is to first think about the knowledge that is required to become aware of the political consciousness that surrounds disability. So that is about trying to ensure that people are making sense of their own experiences, but are starting to think about that within the historical, the political, the social, the broader global configurations of how we engage with each other and the effects that we have in one space, in one geopolitical context, and how that can affect other spaces. So it's about supporting and nurturing people to gain a political consciousness, not to assume that that needs to be required before participation, or to assume that that needs to be done elsewhere before you have a legitimate status and legitimate role within a DPO. So there's something about how DPOs are producing spaces for knowledge to be developed, and for knowledge to be articulated in accessible ways and in relevant ways to young disabled people so that they can understand why this matters and why there is a need to have my to have my voice heard the second strand i think which is quite important to youth participation is to also account for the uh, historical legacy of having your voice as a disabled person and particularly as a young disabled person delegitimized by various uh, aspects of social organization. If we think about perhaps even on our own lives or within those that we're familiar with, you your, your trajectory as a disabled person is often to encounter many numerous uh, actors and stakeholders who tell you that your voice doesn't matter or your voice is not credible or that it requires a professional aspect in order to determine whether your voice had relevance to the spaces that you're trying to engage within. Think about your own lives in terms of how you may try to access uh, healthcare support or access inclusive education spaces or accessible forms of support so that you can do the things that you want to do with your life. Often your voice is dismissed in that space or is seen in a tokenistic way. So for DPOs, I think there's a, there's a need to acknowledge that we are trying to engage with communities of young to people and older to people as well. This has relevance to all those who are newcomers to the space of disability politics but who have had a history of being told that your voice doesn't matter. So there needs to be a, a form of facilitation that not just exposes you to disability politics knowledge, but also exposes you to the skills and the traits and the attributes that demonstrate that your voice does matter. Your ideas do have relevance. 
that you can produce articulations for accessible inclusive societies that will affect what we are doing currently within DPOs and what we could be doing in the future. That's why I think it's incredibly important. And this is what I've captured in my research as well, looking at young disabled people's experiences of resistance, is to think through how often the voice of youth is trapped within only giving a youth perspective on things. Now, I say this carefully because often there are there are there is an essential requirement for young till people to say, I do want to have my own space where we can have self representation as young people to engage in youth uh, and disability politics at the intersection. But there's also a need, I think, for that to transcend and inform the broader agendas and strategies that occur within disability politics, so that we have young till people representing the broader configurations of the executive level of our DPOs, the operational level of our DPOs, and also the activities that are on the ground in trying to build capacity and try to build relationships. It's about the importance of youth, but it's not to assume that youth only has relevance when there is an agenda that denotes a point on youth. And my final point I'd like to make is to, is to recognize the importance of the intersectional approach. Many young cell people are engaged in thinking about how disability intersects with different aspects of their identity. They're starting to think about disability as a global political issue, a geopolitical issue. So it's thinking about how we are trying to produce opportunities for change, not just within our own localities, but also to think about how this has relevance and significance to other communities that maybe do not prioritize disability or to spaces where we have uh, dismiss the indigenous voices of communities who want to think about and consider the significance of disability within their own localities. There's a need, I think, to utilize the creativity and um, the opportunities that is presented when we think about how to imagine new forms of participation for young people to expand that further and say, well, actually, we're talking about global networks and opportunities to bring forward the voice of youth not just within our specific locality, but across the world to capture that youth perspective globally. Mira mentioned intersectionality and many young people using postmodernist thinking based on Foucault and others favor a model of multiple identities and oppressions. Such as having an identity as a disabled person, but also a specific sexual orientation, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered. And indeed, the Black Lives Matter movement coming out of the United States has really said that uh, white people and other groups can't really comment on their position. This is a view, but it's not one that we push in the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum. We respect those and their identity with their experiential movement, but we are fundamentally a social model organization. That is about building a social movement of all people with impairments, long-term loss of physical, mental function, and disabled by the social, cultural, and other features we've already mentioned. And I'm going to pause for a second. Today, 55 of the 56 countries of the Commonwealth have ratified the UNCRPD, which means a higher ratio than other countries in the world. Only Tonga have yet to ratify. And we hope by the time of the CHOGM, C-H-O-G-M, in Samoa next October, they will have done so. So we will have a full house of countries committed to implementing uh, the UN Convention and to disability equality. We heard from Kerry ann at the beginning about what blind and visually impaired people need. Now we shall hear from Rachel Chomba, a 
a CDFP executive member from Zambia on the needs of deaf people. Hello, my name is Rachel Chomba. I am from Zambia. I am also the African Regional Representative for the Commonwealth Disabled People's Forum, or CDPF in short. What is CDPF? CDPF is an organization that supports persons with disabilities to advocate for their rights and implementation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. A lot of organizations for persons with disabilities, they, they are not really sure how they can involve deaf people. Well, these organizations can involve deaf people firstly by engaging sign language interpreters in their organizations to make sure that deaf people have access to information in their organization. Secondly, any other organizations can take a step by learning about deaf culture, which will help them to understand how deaf people live their lives you know, learn about uh, different aspects of challenges faced by the deaf community. So if an organization learns more about how deaf people live their lives and their culture, it will be easy for them to reach out to the deaf and help them. At the same time, it will be easy for them to advocate for the needs of the deaf. So learning deaf culture is very important. How can an organization learn about deaf culture? They can invite a deaf-led organization to give a presentation or just uh, go, go through with them and learn about deaf culture. That will help them to understand and appreciate the challenges uh, faced by the deaf people. Thirdly, how can organizations support the deaf people? A lot of times deaf people face challenges and you know, difficulties when it comes to access to information, education and access to health services. Also including employment, deaf people have challenges to access employment opportunities. So how can these other organizations help the deaf? The problem starts with communication. In your countries, it, you can help the deaf by advocating for the recognition of sign language as a means of communication and make sure that sign language becomes an official language in your individual countries. Once sign language becomes an official language, it will help deaf people to have access to different services without uh, any barriers. Also, in your respective countries, you can sign a bill, you know, adopt a bill that recognizes sign language as a language and use that bill to, uh, to advocate you know, for deaf people to make sure that deaf people have got access to social, to social services. Lastly, you can support deaf people by engaging deaf individuals in your respective organizations. For example, you can have board members that who are deaf, they can be part of your board to represent interests of the deaf community in your board of the organization. Or you can have deaf people uh, participate you know at the same time so that they are able to participate and um, share experiences and changes that they face thank you a group that have been particularly marginalized within the disability movement are deaf blind we will now hear from marcus mackie a deaf blind activist from zambia and what you need to do to include deaf blind people Okay, thank you. My name is Smarty Smarty from Zambia. I'm a person living with deaf blindness, which is a disability of access to information and communication as a result of combined hearing loss and sight loss. Persons with deaf blindness may have complete loss of sense of hearing and complete loss of sense of sight so much that 
the only available option for them to communicate is the use of sense of touch. So in that case, they need support services or a, an intervener who communicates with them in tactile sign language communication to help them understand what is happening in the environment. Some other persons with deaf blindness, like myself, they have residual sight and residual hearing so much that they require sound amplification devices for them to access audio information, auditory information. While those with low vision will require the use of large print or captioned communication for them to, to see or read what is happening around the environment. It is therefore important for every organization that has undertaken to include persons with disabilities to also take into consideration the need to provide support services for deafblind persons in form of interpreter guide or interveners who help them access, interpret the auditory and physical environment to ease both the challenges persons with deaf blindness experience in accessing information, communicating, and also accessing the physical environment and orienting themselves in the environment where they are. Thank you. There are too many different impairing conditions for us to go through all of them uh, and their needs for accommodation. But as a basic way forward, Always ask the person what they need and don't just accept if they say nothing. Many people need more time, rest breaks, plain language, a different dietary needs, supportive relations, especially those with hidden impairments, but because we cannot see their impairment, we assume they don't have needs. But we will look at some important mental impairments. Neurodiversity has only in recent years been identified as a group of impairing conditions, such as autism, ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, and dyspraxia. Let us now hear from Dr. Emil Gauss, CDPF Executive Officer for the Hard to Reach Groups, and a self-advocate for disabled people, and some of his comrades with autism in South Africa. Neurodiversity refers to the neurological inheritance of different developmental disorders. It has been discovered that individuals who are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, ADHD, Attention Deficit Disorder, ADD, Dyslexia, and Alexia had similar brain profiles and were therefore classified under the same conceptual umbrella of neurodiversity. The concept of neurodiversity referred to, or in different studies, acknowledges the current global movement which advocates, ex, advocates advocate for acceptance and the acknowledgement of neurodiverse individuals on different platforms, especially in formal education, including higher education. 
Emphasis needs to be placed on including these individuals as rather educators in society and contributors towards that paradigm shift we are all fighting towards, moving away from a deficit towards a strength-based approach in celebrating the contributions towards society. Neurodiverse individuals can also be included to assist with the training, societal entities and public enterprises through disabled people's organizations, DPOs, and non-government organizations, NGOs. They can inform them about neurodiversity and the different challenges these individuals are confronted with. Neurodiverse individuals can also help to improve the public, private working environment, and public enterprises and make important decisions. When it comes to developing ethical standards, it is an integral first step to formalize expectations and make it clear about which behaviors are and aren't acceptable. Neurodiverse people are people. Neurodiversity is not a justification for abuse or for subjecting neurodiverse people to any harmful therapies and the interventions against their will. This statement is true towards all neurodiverse individuals. There is no group of neurodiverse people that is okay to abuse or harm because they are autistic, alexic, dyslexic, or because of their parts of their identity. Deeming a trait or behavior desirable or undesirable based on whether it is typical of people of a certain age. Teaching autistic children, neurodiverse, to assume that their viewpoint or way of being in social situations is wrong. And therefore, if you think about the social skills, Social skills training that encourages autistic people to merely act near a typical rather than presenting neutral information for navigating social interactions. It is therefore very important that we keep that we are aware of providing care and services that are sensitive and relevant towards the neurodiverse individual's culture, community and social background. Hi, I am privileged today to have interviews with two neurodivergent adults from South Africa and they're going to talk about how neurodiverse individuals can be included in disabled people's organizations that represents neurodiversity and what are the challenges of neurodiverse individuals in South Africa, according to their perspectives. Yes, I think it comes down to one point. Nothing about us without us. Uh, uh, that means that there should be no decisions made, no meetings held, or anything in that kind without uh, uh, neurodivergent people present in such organizations. Uh, such organizations do not have a right to exist if they do not include neurodivergent people. I think, I mean, I don't have an alternative point of view. I 100% agree. I think historically organizations that were charity organizations, organizations that said they were for autistic people really didn't listen to autistic people, didn't consult us didn't actually meet our needs um essentially because they didn't ask what our needs were so i i absolutely 100 percent agree i think we need to be there every step of the way and we can't just be there as a token you can't just have primarily neurotypical people at the head of an organization and then have and a token autistic person. Um, on that point, what are the challenges that autistic people face in South Africa and how can these organizations, according to you, your view, solve them? On my side, I think autism isn't very well understood globally. <laughs> and it's it's more more so even in South Africa if you 
have a, a global problem because we're a country with less resources. It's just going to be exasperated here. Education, and it needs to be, I think the other big thing is I, I'm worried about the research that's out there on autism. It's not all good research, in my opinion. Um, some of it is mouse studies, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, a lot of it is not really involving autistic people. I think it's shifting now and it's improving now, but I, I think there needs to be better quality research out there, really including um, neurodivergent perspectives. Well, I think there's a lot of uh, problems or issues that the, uh, uh, the public mostly and also professionals still got the old ideological idea of what disability is. Uh, 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 where they only think that the person who is dis disabled is a person with a physical disability. Uh, they do not yet consider uh, the un invisible disabilities as disabilities. Um, okay, there's change in government language, there's change in the handbooks, how it is perceived, but it does not uh, uh, go down faster. Psychosocial conditions come under the label of mental health issues and are an example of where the medical model approach is still predominant, reinforced by traditional stigma. Here in particular, many countries are finding it difficult to introduce assisted decision-making in line with Article 12 of the Convention. Rose Umutsi from uh, the CDFP executive and, and the National Organization of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry in Rwanda will fill us in. Uh, I'm called Rose Mutesi and I'm from Rwanda. Uh, I'm the chairperson of Pan PPD, which is Pan African Network for Persons with Psychological Disabilities and at the same time standing for the interest of persons with a social disability in common ways disabled people's forum. I'm going to present, uh, to present on mental health issues. First of all, what is mental health? Mental health is a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope up with stress or fright to realize their abilities, to learn well and work well, and to contribute to their families. Uh, also talk about poor mental health. What is poor mental health? It has a negative effect on person's cognitive, behaviors, emotional, social, and relational well-being, and functioning their physical health and their personal identity and well-being as related to work. Uh, I'm going also to talk, due to limited time, I would like to talk about mental health challenges. What are the challenges first by persons with psychosocial disability? First, I would like to talk about stigma and discrimination among persons with psychosocial disability. Stigmatization of mental illness remains persuasive in the world. This stigma is not only hampers individuals from seeking help, but also perpetuates societal misconceptions about mental health, making it difficult for individuals to openly discuss their struggles, limited access to health services, developing countries often lack adequate resources and infrastructure for mental health care. This includes a shortage of mental health professionals, insufficient treatment, facilities, and lack of essential medications. This result is a vast treatment gap with many individuals unable to access appropriate care. 
Let's talk about poverty and socioeconomic factors. Poverty and mental illness are closely interlinked in developing countries. The, <coughs> the improvised at high risk of experiencing mental health issues due to economical stressors, limited access to education, and increased exposure to trauma and violence. Talk about cultural behaviors. And cultural behaviors play a significant role in how mental illness is perceived. Uh, mental illness is perceived and addressed in many developing countries, traditional beliefs and practices may clash with West, westernized approaches to mental health, complicating efforts to deliver effective care. Uh, also, we have other factors. Can I would also talk, want to talk about isolation of children with psychosocial disabilities and their families. You find that there is stigma and discrimination against children with psychosocial disability, whereby there is an isolation in their families, whereby children with psychosocial disability are being isolated in their, their families. Talk about sexual, sexual violence against persons with psychosocial disability. By here, I mean, you find that younger women and girls and even young boys with psychosocial disability are sexually assaulted. No reporting is done as they are dismissed by the authorities. There is no responsibility of children who are born to women with psychosocial disability who have been left. Talk about first hospitalization in main hospitals. Persons with psychosocial disabilities are taken to hospitals without their consent. They are not allowed to leave the hospitals if they wish to. I would also like to add about uh, uh, human rights violations where persons with psychosocial disabilities are isolated and locked in their rooms, shackled and chained, which we feel like is against the law uh, and against UNCRPD. Discrimination in families. Persons with psychosocial disability are not allowed to decide for themselves. They, are not, they do not have any right in, on the property of their families. There is also forced, uh, forced sterilization. Women and girls with psychosocial disabilities are subjected to forced sterilization by their families, which we feel like, let's say if I'm, I, I'm treated and get cured and I, I get married to someone, how about it if they did do, if they have already done that uh, life uh, forced sterilization that is criminal that is not allowed we feel like we need other forces we need other advocacy strong advocacy to eliminate or to remove those those forced sterilization there is a discrimination in the courts whereby personal disabilities are not allowed to go to court and represent themselves. There is also, I can say, wrongful imprisonment, whereby persons with psychosocial disability are being imprisoned with for that for no reason, just for not uh, talking about themselves. So, meanwhile, let me stop here. But we feel like we need more advocacy. We feel like. Laws and policies should be reviewed uh, on the betterment of persons with psychosocial disability or mental health in general. Thank you so much. Overcoming traditional prejudices is nowhere more serious than when it comes to disabled children and their parents.
convincing parents to stand up for their disabled child's rights to education, health and other things is clearly shown here in the Darabi slum in Mumbai, the biggest slum in Asia, which is in India, where ADAPT and the Inclusion Center Mumbai, an NGO, filmed their methods to challenge this parental barrier, going door to door, uh, convincing parents that their child can do things, would benefit from education, and using street theater and other things to convince residents of the community. When we started Anganwadis, we faced lots of difficulties. Attitude of parents, local leaders, neighbors, and Anganwadi workers were very negative. We have a lot of they did not believe that inclusion is possible. school अगर साधारण स्कूल में भेजूंगी तो कोई टीचर मेरे बच्चे का ध्यान नहीं देगा टॉयलेट बिलट का ध्यान नहीं देगा मैं मेरे बच्चों को अपंग बच्चों के साथ पढ़ने नहीं भेजूंगी क्योंकि मेरा बच्चा भी अपंग बच्चों के जैसा करने लगेगा और मेरे बच्चे का विकास भी नहीं बढ़ेगा जो पर्यंत कम्युनिटी तील लोकांशा समस्या शंका आमी जानून घेत नहीं समझून घेत नहीं तो पर्यंत त्या शंकान से समाधान निराकरण आमी करु शकत नहीं त्या साथी त्या शंका जानून घेना फार महत्वचा है We had the confidence that inclusion will work. So we started by observing the conditions and the experience in day-to-day -day life and the surroundings where they live in. Problem, they use local nala. We went from house to house, talked to the mothers, and found out what the children were familiar with. We got our Anganwadi workers to make teaching aids what we saw in the community, and they came with many ideas. <laughs> We also got our parents to participate so that it would be easier for them to teach the child at home. Some of them even want to learn basic English. English में से कहते हैं green. सब कहे साथ में green. When we first told the Anganwadi workers that they are going to teach normal and disabled together, this is what they said. साधारण मुलान मधे अपंग मुलक कशे शिकवाजी कसे तन्ना बसवेजो कसे संभाल से तन्ना त्यांचा आवडी निवडी त्यांचे सवाई वगैरे अमला कसे का एडजस्ट होणा जहाँ मुलाना बसाले येतना है उठायले येतना है तन्ना आमी कसे उचलना रानी बसवना We trained the Anganwadi workers how to manage the disabled child in the class through feeding, handling, and behavior techniques. अब से साइड में डाल रहे हैं साइड में
खूप आवडतं वी इवन आर अ फादर हु मेड अ सीट फॉर हिस चाइल्ड विथ अ प्लास्टिक टॉप आणि आमची मुलं आता सर्व काही म्हणजे चित्र ओळखू शकतात गाणे सुद्धा घरी म्हणू शकतो एवढा कॉन्फिडन्स त्याच्यात आलेला आहे आणि पण आता लोकशाही टाकताना त्याचं काय पुढे तू व्यवस्थित शिकू शकेल का हो का नाही शिकू शकता आता तुम्हाला दाखवते बघा इथे जो म्हणजे अभ्यासक्रम चालू आहे तिथे पण त्याच प्रकारे ते लोक घेतात वी स्प्रेड अवेअरनेस इन द कम्युनिटी थ्रू रॅली वर्कशॉप अँड स्ट्रीट मेरे बच्चे पहले मुझे शंका थी कि बस्ती की टीचर अपंग बच्चे को कैसे वो पढ़ा पाएंगी मगर मुझे खुशी हो रहा है कि टीचर अपंग बच्चे को पढ़ा रही हैं। हमने देखी भी कि टीचर बहुत कुछ कर रही हैं। जब से ट्रेनिंग मिला है तब से अपंग बच्चे और साधारण बच्चे दोनों को साथ में पढ़ाना बहुत ही आसान हो गया है वी फील Our efforts have been successful. We can see a change in attitude towards inclusive education. मला वाटते कि नॉर्मल मुला अपंगा मुला ही एकत्र शिक्षु शक्ता है। आम चे टीचर ने फार प्रयत्न के लिए लिया। मैं अभी मेरा मेरा बच्चा को साधारण स्कूल में भेजती हूँ। मेरा बच्चा को ना जैसा नॉर्मल बच्चे को ध्यान देता है, वैसे टीचर लोग मेरा बच्चे पर को भी ध्यान देता है। और वो अच्छे से उन लोग के साथ मिल जुल के अच्छे से पढ़ रहा है representing more than 300 groups of disabled people. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Kamau from Kenya. I am the chair of Common Disabled People Forum and I'm also a board member of the United Disabled Persons of Kenya, which is an umbrella body with uh, a representation of over 300 uh, organizations of disabled people and they are led by disabled people. Uh, these organizations represent different types of disabilities also that include deaf blind, neurodiverse, intellectual and mental disabilities, the deaf, the blind, the physical disabled people, among other types of disabilities. They are also representatives uh, in the groups of uh, mothers or caregivers of disabled children who have different types of disabilities. We also have in these groups uh, intersectionality of uh, cutting across the ages, the children with disabilities, the youth, the young adults, and the older persons with disabilities whose different uh, types of needs and support are also taken care of. In Kenya, we have managed the rural urban divide the disability movement by having disabled people organizations forming groups from the national to the grassroots levels. From the national level, we have an umbrella body, for example, the United Disabled Persons of Kenya. We have county federations, we have sub county networks, and at the world levels, we have disabled people organizations are linked to the national or the urban and the rural are linked by having virtual meetings. And DPOs have these meetings and vice versa, either from the grassroots to the uh, national or from the national to the grassroots and the urban to the rural and the rural to the urban, depending on who is calling on those meetings. What we normally do when we have like policy interventions that we need the government to uh, get views from disabled people organizations, the umbrella body at the national level gets a hold of the rural uh, organizations, the federations and the uh, uh, leaders of those organizations through virtual meetings, and then even support such uh, engagement by catering for their data bundles and purchasing airtime for them so that they can be able to give their views, which are brought on board even at the national level by these virtual uh, engagements. So we have those budgets that meet 
such needs. We also have uh, the DPO structures at the grassroots to the national levels, which are used to pass information on WhatsApp groups. We have different WhatsApp groups, we have Instagram and social media pages where that communication flows because uh, we are in the generation of uh, technology and there's no way we can uh, leave behind the social media, which has become a very formidable force for communication. So we also have representation at the uh, Senate and the National Assembly and the County Assemblies, at the World Assemblies, we have uh, disabled people representing uh, others. And they also have a group where they normally meet as the urban and rural and share the different uh, uh, barriers that they are facing as disabled people and the people that they represent. And they also look for solutions to be able to assist those that they represent. And even during the national uh, elections at the United Disabled Persons of Kenya board, we have representation from the grassroots, from the urban to the rural, uh, the, the rural coming to the urban uh, uh, meetings as delegates so that they can be able to elect uh, the, the people they want to represent them. And in these spaces, they are able to show the, that there is democracy in the in the way that they choose who they want to represent them in that uh, in that space, and uh, I think this brings uh, and cuts across the two divides and brings those people together during meetings, during workshops, and using uh, in the current space the virtual platforms and the social media that is very key uh, among even having uh, physical meetings from time to time. Thank you so much. So I hope from all of that, you've got more of an understanding of how we build cross impairment DPOs. And clearly our strength is greater together than being in separate impairment only organisations. Because as we have said, disability and disabilism is created by society and therefore picking out one group from another is a recipe for divide and rule. So we have to be united. So what have we learned from this? The history of disabled people organizing, it's when we get together that we can achieve things. And I was lucky to be part of the Disability Caucus during the years in New York when we made the UN Convention. And it was only because we had something like 80 different organizations from around the world working together as DPOs to put forward amendments to what the diplomats were thinking of putting in that convention, that we have a convention that is fit for purpose. And it's not perfect, which is why you need to look at the general comments which keep coming from the committee. But nevertheless, it was a real paradigm shift as we've said. So we need to learn from that history. We also need to learn from the organization of some groups, some impairment groups, particularly blind and deaf people, got organized long before other people and did get priority treatment because of that. But now we have to address impairment worldwide and unite. We need in those organizations to function democratically, but be impairment friendly. So as Carrie Ann said, if she doesn't feel comfortable in the room, she can't really participate. So we need to make sure each person's impairment needs are being met. For that reason, at the end of the notes, there will be much more detail of the type of etiquette or good manners to different people with different impairments you need to know. We need to challenge prejudice and abusive behavior amongst our members. We can't allow the normative views on women, race, or even indeed in many of our countries, homophobic views, which are not really conducive to allowing all people to come together in our movement. We also need to reverse the hierarchies in society inside our movement. We can't just reproduce them because, for instance, high caste people have always run things in India 
that they are the only people who run disability organizations. Though social relations are important, we are not primarily a social club, but political organizations. And when I mean political, it's with the small p. We're not party political, but we are about changing the world. And that is about making our will felt and therefore it is political. And we should have clear aims. We should never lose sight of our objectives, be deflected, be co-opted into government because they offer us nice jobs. We need to beware of setting ourselves up as a silo. We need to be open to the constituency we represent, which is for you uh, umbrella organisations, is all disabled people in that country. And we need to think about the groups we haven't yet got in touch and brought in. We need to find ways of bringing them in. So beware of silos. We may also become service providers. As you heard, the Barbados Council uh, officiates parking places in Barbados. But we need to keep our independence from government. We can work with them, but we need to be a separative representative voice of those we represent. And remember this to finish. If you always do what you have always done, you will always get what you have always got. Be the change, as Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in society. Thank you.